Dong, Dong. Hi, I'm Patricia. Welcome to the 100th episode of A Breath of Song. I am so glad you chose to do this today, which is extra special because Lisa G. Littlebird is joining us for a songwriter conversation. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Hi, Patricia. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. I feel really lucky. Mark Nepo wrote, We are challenged daily to find everything in ourselves, shaping ourselves to the wonders we find until, like birds, we too make song at the mere appearance of light. Hmm. We're here to uncover those shapes that respond inside us to the world with songs that help us heal and adapt and grow. Your voice is exactly what's needed for this. I'm coming to you straight from my home in what is now called Burlington, Vermont, on the unceded lands of the Abenaki. And Lisa, tell us where you're calling from. I am calling from Santa Barbara, California today, the Chumash territory here. Mm. All of our voices will turn up as they are, and no matter what, we can feel the connection to our breath and vibration in our body. Let's find how good it can feel to sing. Last week, I shared Lisa's song, Turning Wheel. That's a powerhouse of a song, right? Today, Lisa will be teaching us a relatively new song of hers called Bridging Hearts Song. Still called Bridging Hearts Song? That's right. (laughs) Excellent. We'll learn it slowly so it can settle inside you and you can begin to trust it as a resource. Let it move you into a state of flow. Then we get to enjoy a conversation with Lisa and we'll close out with the song again at the end. You'll always be able to find this episode with full show notes and artwork on the website, abreathofsong.com. So let's start with just a bit of a warm-up, a yawn stretch. Oh, maybe... (laughs) Rolling your shoulders or arcing your sides. Mm, Whatever muscles are calling out to you to move, to tend, to round, to lengthen. Mm, Really feeling into your body. And as you're moving, starting to notice how the breath comes in and out to just support you as you move. And noticing especially as it comes in, it can widen your rib cage. And as it goes out, it can release. As it comes in, it can widen into your belly and the sides of your abdomen and it can take something with it. And you can let it drop into your pelvis, widen your hips, and release and soften your whole back. One more coming in wherever it wants to go. And as it goes out, letting it stretch your face. Next time, let it start making sound on the exhale. (sighs) However that sound appears. And again, in. (sighs) And letting that sound start to roller coaster. Soften your lips. Mm, Maybe in one more time and making Baba Yaga sounds. And in again, going into flow sounds. Lisa, I'll turn it over to you to share the song. Hmm. Thank you so much, Patricia. And I really want to begin by thanking you for what you've created here. It's really remarkable and what a service to our singing world. Really impressed by your coordination, your expertise, your devotion. 
and your community building. Thank you. Thank you. The song, Bridging Heart Song, um, you know, I, I really see all songs as sorcery. They're spells, and that purpose is to shift energy inside and outside of our being and that when we we create vibration with intentionality and focus that it changes our state our state of being Mm. in our mind and in our hearts and therefore um, creates possibility for changing the state of our world and so that's the vision that I hold and each song does it in a different way you know, turning wheel is an activating song, and it's a lot of like a lot of community songs. It's designed to create beauty through harmony and through the layered parts, and you know the intersection of the the nuance and the notes is part of the sorcery. Mm-hmm. And then I have other songs like bridging heart song that feel more like a toolbox song. So they weren't created with an intentionality to be a multi-layered, beautiful choir, three-part song. They were designed to get right to the heart of a uh, contraction in my being and to shift the energy around it and to help me expand my perspective to be able to open my heart again. Mm. And so this song came up is a very practical response on the day I was beginning to lead a retreat uh, in response to uh, a friend whose behavior was crossing a boundary for me and activating and triggering me. And I wanted to keep my heart open to them. And so I prayed. I, I got in uh, my hot tub at the house where I lived at the time and hot water is where so many of my songs seem to be born. <laughs> <laughs> and this song came in response to that prayer, and it came fast, and it came fully formed. And then it was quite remarkable, because later that day, I faced one of the most challenging experiences I've ever had as a retreat leader in a completely different context. And I brought this song forward in the moment with the person with whom the challenge was happening. And we looked in each other's eyes and she learned the song. She was the first person to ever learn the song. And we sang it straight at each other. Um, And it was one of the more profound moments I've ever had in singing in community and truly using the spell of a song collaboratively to shift the energy and to open our hearts to the circumstance that was happening. In this case, neither of us had a particular problem with each other, but with a circumstance that was extremely difficult. And we used the song to build our courage. So I wanted to give that backstory because it's really essential to the heart of the Mm. message of the song. Beautiful. And it's in two parts. I'll sing the first part. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs were part of a team. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. That's the first part. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs, we're part of a team. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. The second line, we're part of a team sometimes spontaneously changes Uh, once or many times I've sung it's part of a plan so I find that having a little fluency with letting the words come in authentic connection from the singer is what really makes the spell potent so that it really feels alive and connected so this is full permission to make this song 
yours in the context that's needed. So let's sing it through once with, it's part of a plan. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs, it's part of a plan. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. Second part. I care about you, you care about me. This is what it feels like in family. I care about you, you care about me. Help us find our love in this ecology. And then it circles back to the top. And the I care about you and the you care about me is an immediate call and response. So I care about you, I care about you, you care about me, you care about me. And then it comes back together for the rest. And you might hear a little background noise. I have a loud heater in the home where I am. I'll sing that whole second section. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. This is what it feels, feels like, like in family. family. I care about you. I, I care, care about, about you. You care about me. You, you care, care about, about me. me. Help us Let's find our love in the sea. Call Back to the top. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs, we're part of a team. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. This is what it feels like in family. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. Help, Help us to find our love in this ecology. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs were part of a team. Both our needs have got to get met here. Here, so let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. This is what it feels like in family. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. Help us find our love in the sea. Ecology. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs were part of a team. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. And find the bigger picture. And find the bigger picture. Whew. I'm so moved that you chose to bring that particular song, Lisa, because I've been doing one of the things that I've been exploring this year for myself is collaboration and tending partnerships and all of the questions that that raises and all of the history that I deal with for myself in trying to bring as much of a forgiven self as I can to partnership. I think relationship is the master class of the life that we live and Finding ways to keep our hearts open in conflict is the most challenging thing that I've ever found. And that every spiritual teacher that I know um, seems to um, agree, you know, that that's the final frontier, you know, the old spiritual adage. If you feel like you're enlightened, go spend a week with your family. 
Yes. yes <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or try to c collaborate with a singing group or any group of people. Yeah. And to me, the song is about reminding me what it is to be right-sized because so much of relational difficulty comes in when um, our, our needs feel more important than other people's needs or we feel too small to speak up for our needs and other people's needs are made more important. And mm -hmm. what is it to really vision a world of deep equality where everybody is truly and deeply equal that we may have very different stories and different intensity inside of our trauma and different needs in the moment. And certainly at different times, some of us need more or less tending. But at a core level, to remember to truly feel, not just conceptually comprehend that no one is more important than me and no one is less important than me is mm. to me just a profound spiritual practice and the song is is uh, an endeavor to remember being right-sized inside of my human family that is that is a beautiful transition to the way i was hoping to introduce our conversation because to me, you are one of the legends in the community singing world, right? I, I don't usually give a lot of backstory on these podcasts because I figure people who are interested can go Google the information, right? But in your case, I'm making an exception because of how I heard about you originally. I came out of the traditional choral world. I came out of a very... Um, oh, how do I want to say, tiered world mm -hmm. where people were above or below each other mm -hmm. in every situation. Um, in 2016, I founded an unauditioned community chorus that was about developing skills to sing and not being chosen because of your existing skill set. And at the time, I'd never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never heard of the community singing movement. By early 2018, I was searching for more ways in which I could build group oral singing skills and song sharing skills for myself. And I found your flight school as an online course, which seemed a little suspect in those pre-pandemic years. You know, could we really learn online, not in person? But you had this, this beautiful, wholehearted chorus. You had a polished website. I listened to your entire Song A Day project from 2014 mm -hmm. and was blown away by this idea of just continually drawing in new songs and and putting them out in an imperfect way and how much I received from that. And then I, I started looking and you taught at Esalen and you've been featured in Oprah's magazine. I, so I was sold. That was it. That was the <laughs> that was <laughs> whole thing. <laughs> Thanks, so I joined a flight school cohort in 2019 and I got to meet you and I got to sing with you at the treat, which was part of the course. And you became for me this, this, this huge doorway, this huge invitation, this permission to move in, in a complex, in a hurting world with authenticity, with integrity, with right sizedness and with joy, and I will always, ever be grateful for this mentorship that you gifted me, which has significantly changed my life, changed the way that I move through the world. Thank you, so, Patricia. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being willing to be your size and, and step into that. So I puzzled over how to start our conversation, you know, how to, how to move you out of that, my fangirl spot <laughs> <laughs> and make space for you to be able to be real too, you know, not just, I, because there's, there's such an awkward dynamic that's not fair to you either. It sort of stops you from being able to be your full self. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start by asking you, what's the first sound you make when you wake up in the morning? <laughs> uh, I, I, 
humbly admit it's frequently a groan in response to my alarm. <laughs> what does that sound <laughs> like? Oh. Mm. I'm curious, why do you choose to wake with an alarm? Well, my life is quite full mm-hmm. and my sleep is irregular sometimes. And so it's, um, it's ideal, of course, when I have the spaciousness to be able to wake organically. And that does happen, but um, I'm yeah. often just getting the sleep that I can get yeah. before another big day. Yeah. And that's where I am right now. What's the very earliest song memory you have? What comes to mind is singing in my choirs as a child. Um, I was very active in music as a kid. And yeah, I have vivid memories in my elementary school and in my church, singing the songs that really opened my heart. And while this predates actual authentic memory from in me my my parents actually audio taped me singing at age one and I still I have 11 second clip of me singing um at age one so of course I had to ask Lisa to send me this clip and I'm going to insert it right now here it comes What's your name? Gato. How old are you? One. And uh, my mom was an opera singer. So music was always in my home since I could remember. And so it's just mm-hmm. been a very natural and organic source of expression and inspiration since truly before birth she was actively touring in an opera company while she was pregnant with me and I I also use song as company you know in um, my my childhood years it was a different age you know in the 70s in Iowa there wasn't nearly the level of kind of parental supervision that I see is mainstream culture standard Mm -hmm. now. It was really like, Mm -hmm. leave the house in the morning with your big wheel at age five. And then my mom would hoo-hoo at 5 p.m. from whatever friend's house I was at within a three-block radius. I would hear it and come home. And I would walk around my neighborhood. I remember walking to elementary school, and I would sing my kind of journal entry to myself than to God. I would just, uh, my life was a musical and I would just sing whatever I was thinking and feeling on my way to school every day and walking around the neighborhood. So that's probably the most um, precious early memory I have of using song to be a sorcerer. That's beautiful. How did it evolve from there? Did did your voice always stay a companion to you, a familiar companion, or did it go through stages, shifts? Did you find yourself distanced from it at any point? Certainly, yeah. It was it was a constant stream of singing with groups and with people and in performative situations through college. Mm-hmm. And when I left college... Uh, of which I was a vocal performance major, I felt pretty uh, distanced from my natural, authentic motivation to keep singing because the performative aspects had really sucked the authentic joy and juice from Mm -hmm. it. The perfectionistic Mm -hmm. standards had really boxed me outside of my heart and so I took a break uh, in my early 20s, and, and it wasn't until I started hanging out around a group of people who liked to camp and sing around campfires that I really kind of reignited my connection to song and to the joy of singing together. And then I was invited to join the Denver Women's Chorus, which, like your chorus, was a non-auditioned chorus. 
And my snobby performance-based self thought, oh, I don't think I'll be challenged enough in a non-audition chorus. It won't be fun, you know, because I'll be wanting it to be better. And it was so different than that. Patricia, I was so humbled. I just cried like a baby at the first rehearsal when we went and just sang songs. We did use sheet music. It wasn't a community singing choir, but it was not about perfectionism. It was about connection. And we closed every um, gathering, every rehearsal and every concert with a song that was learned in oral tradition, holding hands. And I just remember tears streaming down my face and that this possibility for for song to be easier, to be soothing, and to mm. get past the barriers of my conditioning was, um, was possible. I wonder what it was that allowed you to make that opening to a different way. People. Yeah. People. It's the wooing of the people. Uh-huh. Somebody that you love invites you to do something long enough, you're probably going to do it. Uh, let's woo each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's woo each other into song making. I love that. So you already talked about your hot tub being a good place for songs to appear. Most definitely. How else do you invite songs into your life? For me, it comes to making intentional space, creating enough space in my life that's unscheduled, mm -hmm. and then bringing enough oomph of, of desire to it, that it requires a certain threshold of prayer, of desire, of intentionality, for something to receive that much focus and mm -hmm. allow a birthing to happen. But I find if I really even just create five minutes with powerful intent, a song is there. What do you find stops you from creating that time? All the other priorities of a life. And uh -huh. also, for me, it's about, um, it's precious, right? And so there's a dance for me between keeping something precious and not letting it become so normalized that it becomes mundane. I could improv a song at all at any time, right? That would be something. But right. if I really right. am calling in a song to be a spell that lasts, I want, I, I don't want to do that every day. I want to do that right when the moment is ripe and when I'm really in the space to be an antenna and catch and receive what's needed yeah. for something beyond just myself. So when you sing now, what does your voice bring you as an individual with your voice first and then into community? Yeah, it's intimacy. Right, it's intimacy because it's inescapable the confronting yeah. uh, tenderness that the, yeah. the inner listener um, being in relationship with the singer um, is holding, right? That is, that is uh, always yeah. going to be vulnerable no matter how experienced we get. There's, a, there's an intimacy and a tenderness to that relationship. And for so many people, it is one of the most confronting places of mm. um, you know, evocative self-judgment or shame or any number of other things. You know, the, they say the voice can't lie, the singing voice can't lie, right? I mean, we, we might be able to become really good imitators or performers, but there's a quality, there's a tone, there's an authenticity that rings through the voice that's inescapable, and it's just what it is. And it's like looking in the mirror and the confronting 
mm-hmm. seeing of, oh, this is the costume that I'm wearing. And, you know, I can su- superficially do things to adjust it, but this is what I got. Like it or leave it. And it's about every day making friends with what's here and realizing that nothing actually has to change for my relationship to it to change. That my voice is the same as it's always been and some days I love it and some days I wish it was completely different and I have a lot of (laughs) self-judgment and... Uh, nothing much has changed except (laughs) my mindset and my heart my heart's orientation and so that to me is the greatest teacher of the voice and anything else that confronts us is um, is the opportunity to recognize I have choice in my orientation if not in the quality of the tone that's coming through I often find that when I am hiding from myself in some way, I'm feeling some feeling that I've decided I'm not supposed to be feeling, and I'm doing air quotes, supposed to be feeling. Mm -hmm. And what I notice is when I sing during those moments, the quality of my voice is different because there's tension, I think, basically, physically. There's just a physical thing going on. Because I'm feeling something I don't want to be feeling, and so I'm shutting off my body's tense. And the quality of my voice starts to sound a little pinched, sometimes maybe even shrill or pushed. Or I, At first, I would hear that, and I would think, oh, yeah, that's my voice. What a mess. You know, (laughs) I don't want to listen to that. It took me a long time to, to find enough space to actually physically relax enough to be able to find, hear my, what actually is my voice. Beautiful. That was there all along. That's the truth teller of the body. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And in that way, it's an instrument that guides you toward something because it makes it more visible. Exactly. Yeah. I know when I sit down to sing and it's not sounding and and I'm listening and I'm thinking, ooh, that doesn't sound good. I know that that's a time that I need to breathe and listen and pay attention to what's happening. Yesterday, I actually had a relationship just like you're describing. You know, anger has been a, a not supposed to, air quotes, um, emotion uh-huh. in my conditioning and I was working with fire in my body and in my belly and just how normalized it is to try to contain it and and clench it and not let it move and mm-hmm. I was playing and in a beautiful invitation with another trusted person to welcome the fire and to use and you know, she asked, where do you feel um, it in your body? And I could feel the fire in my belly and I could feel the pinch in my throat. That became a cue for me. I could just feel, without making a sound, I could feel just the pit, the, the quality of the holding at the throat yeah. level. And I could, that for me was the invitation that that energy wants to move through the voice. And so I just let myself sound from my belly through the voice and in a single sound where I really let myself go for it, yeah, my entire energy body changed and I could feel the fire distribute and I could feel my hands and my feet were warm, which is almost never the case. <laughs> I could feel how it moved fire and, and so I do think that the power of the voice to um, unblock channels of energy is yes. really profound. Yes. And it's it's really, I mean, going from a, a musical geek perspective, it's really fascinating because in order to use our instrument to its full capacity, we need to engage all the way down into the pelvis, as well as then muscles in the stomach, muscles in the diaphragm, muscles in the intercostals, and release, release through the throat, release open space, through up into the face and and our 
we can vibrate, literally vibrate our entire bodies with this instrument. And of course, like any vibration, if it hits up against tension or tightness, that stops or damps the vibration, right? So our bodies give us this instant feedback. It's incredible. What a master game. <laughs> yes. Pretty good. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bodies. One of my singing cohort friends called you goddess of permission to share. Aww. <laughs> I take that as a high compliment. <laughs> Can you talk about what's involved with giving people permission? Well, to me, it's all about removing the obstacles to it because we are born with permission. It's not me or any authority who can give or take away permission. It's our own self-judgment, in my experience, is the number one obstacle. Darn. I thought I could just call you up <laughs> and say, okay, Lisa, I need permission now. <laughs> I thought every time I was hitting a block, it was you withholding permission from me to share. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> my phone is, that's why my phone's been ringing so much. Everybody's saying, time for permission. Come on, let it loose. <laughs> I'm so um, interested in what it is to accompany each other in our walk toward liberation. And that... Um, all of us have internalized messages at different levels of uh, closure to some aspect of our wholeness or liberation. And, and that when somebody really is embodying fewer obstacles, they become this beacon for us, right? Of like, wow, they don't seem to have the thing that I have. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's possible. And maybe I should hang around them. And that's been my path. I just find beacons. I find people who have something that I want uh -huh. and follow them around. And the slow, like drops of water on a stone, wearing away of those conditioned obstacles is the whole thing for me. Mm. And once we find ourselves in a community and a culture that doesn't support those obstacles remaining held up, then they, they have a real force to reckon with that they usually can't, they can't hold out for. So how did you get involved with community singing? Thinking of group permission and... Totally. I mean, like all good things, I feel like it's all been a giant unfolding surprise. It's not been me sitting in a room or with my journal like, I am going to create ba 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 and I'm gonna find ba 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 and you know, it's not it's not that linear. Um, it's simply following the next breadcrumb and I was in a real I, I mean, I should say, you know, song has been one of the primary through lines of my life, and I follow music like I follow a good smell, but it's secondary to my spiritual intentionality and my interest in expanding consciousness and opening the heart in this life. And I was coming up against the next layer of real challenging, binding, uh, trauma and conditioning in my own being that drew me out to uh, Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California to do some deep study in personal growth and relational work. And while I was there, I had the incredible unexpected fortune of being exposed to Isai Barnwell, one of the founders of Sweet Honey in the Rock. And she would come out every year and lead a week of singing um, in the African American tradition. And I took in her workshop, and lo and behold, she taught 40 songs in four part intricate harmonies without a lick of sheet music or lyric sheets. I'd never been exposed to that. And the possibilities just blew my mind way open. And everybody was talking in the workshop, the participants were saying at lunch and so forth, like, how does she hear all the harmonies in her head? And there was a part of me going, I can, I hear the harmonies. 
I can do that. And it didn't occur to me that that was an unusual skill and that I'd actually had enough exposure and training in music to get, have a real gift already in my wheelhouse that I didn't know was a gift. And so from that place, I began experimenting and I received support at SLN to start my own song circle there for just anybody who was there free. I was unpaid um, to come and learn some songs. And I started as all budding song leaders do very uptight and perfectionistic and really <laughs> wanting to give people an experience that they loved and wanted to be liked and and through experience and through lots and lots of trial and error and times where 30 people came and times where one person came, I just got more and more comfortable and adaptable and confident in the ability that it doesn't matter what the constellation is, it doesn't matter what my mood is, it doesn't matter uh, what the song is, but it there's a power that leaves me feeling better 100% of the time. I love that you're focused on what you were getting out of it, no matter how many people were there, because it's so tempting. I think many song leaders and many people who sing in groups as well tend to kind of evaluate a group, a group's success on the number of people who are showing up. So right. understandable. Yeah, absolutely. I really, because I faced that so directly and concretely so many times, I got to really ask the question, would I rather know that I have changed one life deeply or that I've touched 30 people's lives in a way that they may or may not remember tomorrow? And it became so clear I was more interested in the vertical than the horizontal, more interested mm -hmm. in depth. Mm -hmm. Another question I've sometimes asked myself is, how would you have really loved to spend this last hour and a half of your life? Would you have rather spent it singing with one person or in your room with your journal writing about how you're going to create a better song circle next time? Totally. You know, I'd rather spend the time singing. <laughs> totally. Let's just do it. Let's be in the play and the, the experiment, the grand divine show together in real time. So the grand experiment, this pandemic, has been a time of such challenge and maybe enforced rest, maybe deep grief for some community choruses and their leaders. What is growing for you out of this time? It was a real awakening for me. I, I have what I call ZFLS, Zest for Life Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it had an acronym. <laughs> it does now. I am um, a textbook overcommitter and really noticed and was kind of stunned at the level of relief that I felt as soon as the world stopped. And I really took that as a signal of seeing, wow, I've heard other people say, like they actually experienced relief when they got sick because they had to stop and thought, oh, that's so sad. And then it happened to me when the entire world stopped and there was a huge, you know, life-threatening virus. I felt relief and it really showed me that I was leaving out, and I knew that that was true, but I just didn't know how to begin to shift my schedule and my priorities in such a way that reorganized and centered my own self-tending. And the pandemic was a profound gift in that way of really enforced reprioritization. And yet it still remains a challenge in the, you know, coming back into a full mm -hmm. and busy life of which I am busy and full and probably overcommitted once again. But it has a different <laughs> flavor because I'm absolutely unwilling to sacrifice my health and my somatic 
connection to my own heart and belly in the day-to-day experience of my life. And I'm getting better at making fewer promises and mm-hmm. better at using that space to show up wholeheartedly for what is present. And there is grief in that because I can't do everything that I was doing before and hold and lead community in the ways that I was, I was doing that before. But it has refocused my vision on the depth that I mentioned I'm so Mm -hmm. oriented to and realizing that means I won't be able to maybe touch as many people and hold as many people in my sphere but the ones that are here starting with myself above all um, deserve my focus and love without distraction Mm. I've been noticing coming coming out of the pandemic as we are that I I am not taking on as much yet. And and it's because I don't feel I have the capacity for it. And I don't know whether I ever will again. There's a beautiful humility in that to me and the calling of arising for more leadership. And that feels to me really appropriate that there was in the, in the vision of being right sized, if I'm over committing, some part of me is believing that if it's going to happen, I have to do it. And I take a stand that that is false premise. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that it's taking space from someone else. Totally. So you were asked to do some difficult things as a community choir leader, I think. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about them, maybe starting with just the the question of, as a community leader, when issues arise that are not just somebody singing the right notes or not, but maybe there's a divorce between two choir members or a serious conflict between two choir members or... Maybe somebody starts ghosting the choir and, and never lets you know why they didn't come or or does let you know in a confrontational, difficult way. Aside from singing the song, now we have the song that's a tool <laughs> that we can use when difficult issues arise. What is your process of responding? Yeah, I... I don't have a formula. I wish I could say, here's the magic. Um, But I do know the power that patient loving presence has to change all circumstance for the better. And something that, you know, the hard lesson of leadership is that leadership comes with the vulnerability of being extra visible and projected upon, right? When we stand in front of groups, then uh, we become real prime targets, perfect people for people to overlay their expectations of anybody in a leadership role. And it became really clear for me pretty early that if I took that personally, I would not last. And so um, it's painful, you know, when negative projections come forward. And, you know, honestly, um, the majority of the projections tend to be positive and life affirming and boosting. Right. But I also could feel like it was a different quality, like when there's a ego boost, it it doesn't feel actually good to me. I was going to say that's also a kind of boxing in or not being seen. That's also a projection. Totally. What feels really good is authenticity and getting real. And so um, I I think holding in my leadership of community singing a boundary that the purpose of our connection is sung is crucial because... Um, then all the other conflicts and things that life is rife with fall underneath and are metabolized inside of that container 
and everything outside of that container is for your therapist and for <laughs> your best friend and not for me, right? And so um, to me, it's about I'm offering one very particular tool that is not designed to be a complete picture. Like our lives are very complex and nuanced and we need lots of mentors and support in all kinds of different ways and locations. But song is for me one of the fastest metabolizers of difficult emotions and can kind of create the sensitivity and the willingness to to have a more generative and fruitful meeting and conversation. And so um, a lot of it is getting clear with what I'm, what my job is and what my job isn't. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is also really being willing to be somebody's villain. That, that's actually also, if I'm going to be cast in... God's play <laughs> or you know the great play of life I am willing to play roles and characters for different people as long as it's purposeful for them and that's a hard pill to swallow but I've realized is absolutely necessary if one is going to step into leadership many people start their groups with a few friends for example and then others come in and join, maybe. Or maybe you start with a bigger group, but somebody comes in that, that you really like, that you can see a relationship developing with outside of chorus, somebody you want to be friends with. And I know that there are some people who say, my rule is, if they're in my community singing group, they're not my friends, which feels artificial how do you deal with the fact that the way that we are humans, the way that things work, we end up attracted to some people more than others? Mm, yeah, I've never seen it as a problem. I just follow the intelligence of my body, the way life moves through me, my attractions and aversions. I trust them and I don't think they need to be problematic and I yeah. I think taking a stand and knowing that without apology all of us have natural attractions and aversions it's the foundation of our authenticity yeses and nos that come through yeah. our bodies and that if we don't follow them we create this dis-ease and so it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't strike me as problematic in any way. Thinking of, of yeses and nos and, and dis-ease, after, especially after George, George Floyd was murdered and before as well, there was and there is discomfort for many in the community song world about how predominantly white the spaces are. Mm-hmm. Yet many of the songs shared come from black or indigenous communities, song creators. And shortly after George Floyd's murder, at least then, I was aware that you were being asked specifically to step into the role of helping the song leading community, song leading community navigate mm -hmm. Grab this question, grapple with this question. Talk to Oini about how you took that on, what you did when you were asked to tend this, this issue. It was less being asked to tend it than it was feeling like a natural extension of my commitment to my relationships and that I was building relationship with um, beloved members of our community who are black or African heritage or other heritage and we're having big feelings, naturally, in this perfect mm -hmm. storm. And love, for me, says, as the Lawrence Cole says, you know, takes care of everything that's near the Hafiz poem that he put to music so beautifully. And, and so my love said, how can I tend you to these beloveds in my life? And 
what I kept seeing and hearing was visualize, you know, visualize what's happening, let's name it so that we can begin to bring energy, focus and healing toward it because what happens is um, the cultural mainstream attention span is very short. It's the span of a news mm -hmm. cycle. And mm -hmm. if George Floyd was yet another news cycle where there was a bunch of interest and engagement for a week and then it all disappeared again, then that almost feels worse than nothing happening. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, it was a kind of a gauntlet of really laying down saying, I'm not looking for your attention for a week. I'm looking for your love for a lifetime. And that was a deep um, transmission. It was, I really heard it at the core of my being and that my capacities are dynamic. They go up and down in terms of what I can actually do, but my commitments and what I prioritize are the path that I walk in my daily life for the rest of my life. And so um, it really underscored the need for the right-sized <laughs> um, prayer mm -hmm. because, um, you know, really what we're talking about is in undercurrents of unexpressed racism, there's a conditioned belief that some are more important than others and their experience is more important than others. And if I take a stand that that's not true, I have to face the ways that it, that arises in my day-to-day -day experience and, um, mm -hmm. and face the shame that arises in response to what I find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes a lot of courage and it really takes a community. And so my interest is in just supporting true relationship building for a lifetime that really holds what it is to have an experience of um, being in a white body and what it is to have an experience of being in a black body and how different those worlds are in this culture. Thank you. Talk to me about the practices that support you in being able to be aware, in being able to tune in, in being able to notice what the message was that you were getting for yourself. Mm. What lets you hear that? I'm a devotional being. I really believe in prayer and a relationship with something greater than myself. And so my commitment to make space for devotion and for listening to a higher guidance is the core of my my life experience. It's a non-negotiable mm -hmm. and it's deeply integrated and embedded into my way of being. And so I think that's probably the answer to what you're asking. I'm going to ask, you don't have to answer. I'm going to ask about specifics. How does that, you know, does that turn into four hours of chanting between 10 and 2 each day? Or does that turn, is that 20 minutes of a moment when you wake up? Or how, does, how do you turn that into an actual practice. Yeah, totally. So it starts in silence to me. It starts in really making space for uh, non-distraction. It's a hard world to find mm -hmm. silence in, mm -hmm. and it's the most precious commodity to me, that all mm -hmm. song is born from silence, and so I seek silence frequently, and I love making space to sit in silence without agenda. And I'm a big meditator. I meditate a lot. It's you know the practice of being with what is without fixing and pointing my heart's arrow in the direction of compassion. And that that is a daily practice that sometimes comes easily and sometimes feels like a huge Herculean workout. And then I orchestrate my life such that everything revolves around connection points that are intentional. And so I would say um, that's actually one of the deeper practices of my life is gathering people with 
like mind and heart to practice together. And so the four to 10 hours of chanting for me does happen um, on a regular basis, not every day by myself, mm -hmm. but in groups. And those uh, opportunities to come together and practice and deepen in a very powerfully intentional way have given me glimpses of what I'm here for. And then the rest of my life is spent um, making myself open enough to find that quality in my day-to-day -day experience. Mm. So you're looking at a rhythm of intense communal devotional experience. Yeah. Followed by daily life where where there's a familiar there's a feeling that's familiar now. There's something that you recognize yes. and can yes. watch for and create space for. Yes. In the in-between times. And I find, you know, really a lot of my work is getting, personally, my personal work is getting comfortable with the mundane is devotional. It's not the mm. thing in, the, it's not the obstacle to <laughs> devotional life, which has really been my kind of unspoken, unconscious belief for a long time of like, oh, if only I could live there in the really expanded state. And the laundry is just never ending and all the bills and like oh but if only there weren't dentists and taxes and car problems <laughs> and yet that's actually the game that we're playing we're playing the game of how do i bring my love here for a long time i thought that i would end up in a monastery mm -hmm. Somewhere because it just seemed too hard yeah. to bring it into daily life. It's a big task. Yeah. Not worthwhile. Yeah. Agreed. Are there any other practices that you are that you engage with that support you in your life? So many. So many. You know, to name some a couple. Therapist. You know, mm -hmm. I really appreciate therapy, and it's not the whole game for me. You know, for me, I'm I'm here for a psychological plus a spiritual approach, and mm -hmm. and you know, finding mentorship, elders, and you know, people with embodied wisdom in different ways of being um, that really expand my world. I'm I'm here looking as an antenna for expansion points when I'm come in contact with this person or this podcast or this color do I feel more invited inspired and expanded or do I persistently feel more contracted averse and small and really pay attention to my own body's wisdom and responses that teach me my yeses and my noes in this life um Time in nature, for me, you know, I tune my fork to the sounds and rhythms of nature, for sure. Just the, the feeling of sunlight on my face or the sound of wind and grass or the birds is enough to reset my whole compass. And um, the elements, really keeping the elements in balance for myself, keeping them in harmony, really is a... Mm -hmm. is a a guidepost and a, a practice, but I would say I need simplicity. We live in a complicated world where I can't remember what I'm doing you know, so much of the time <laughs> that I need something that I can't forget. And for me, what I can't forget is that um, my experience of truth is that it almost always feels like a, a paradox. And I have a teacher who says, you know, paradox is duality without contradiction. And that's really what I'm aiming for, where I can mm. hold all of it and it's all well. Mm -hmm. Even things that are apparent opposites, you know, that that's actually the place of creation and, and 
and where it's at you know it's generative for me and yeah. you know i think one of the central paradoxes is that it's both okay and not okay to have a closed heart yeah i remember reading once that jimmy carter had a particular advisor whose sole job it was to keep his calendar and i remember being so jealous because <laughs> this advisor evaluated everything that came up and decided whether or not it belonged on the calendar. Wow. And Jimmy Carter's job was to come to each thing fully present and then to the next thing fully present. And he had met, obviously, with this person and they had talked through and decided what, which things overall were important. They'd had a calendar time for getting together to focus on what needed to go on the calendar. And then he could let go of it, you know, so that he was really bringing this full focus to each thing as it came. And I thought to myself, oh, Patricia, you could actually do that, too in some way, but I would much rather have somebody else keeping my calendar. Well, that's actually my experience of it. I feel like the, the person in me that m makes the plans and puts them on the mm -hmm. calendar is not the one that shows up for them. <laughs> and that's the whole negotiation of our lives, yes. right? So yes. what is it to get those two in more cahoots? <laughs> yes. And that it's lovely to have a closed heart as well as an open heart. You need to have the no's as well as the yeses that clarity of boundary? Well, for me, boundary is healthiest when it's accompanied with an open heart. That mm. open heart doesn't mean yes. And I actually think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make is believing that if I have an open heart, I have to say yes to everything. And it's definitely not true. Right. It's, it's the presence or absence of I wish you well inside the no. Yes. Yes, absolutely. What are the biggest questions that you're carrying right now? You named one of them, how to do this, this both and. Yes, I think, you know, the big central questions haven't really changed a lot in my life. They just come in and out of focus or new layers of understanding. But I'm pretty interested in... It's a hard one to articulate, but we live in a culture and a world full of constraints and rules and norms, right? There's normative behavior and non-normative behavior, for better or for worse. And when we get to a certain level of non-normative behavior, we are categorized as psychologically unwell or um, to be incarcerated or any number of other, you know, negative things. Um, I'm air quote negative things. And I am pretty curious about that intersection of allegiance to my body's intelligence. And when that deviates from normative behavior, when it's appropriate to come into harmony with the normative culture and when it's appropriate to take a stand in my authenticity. And so that's another reason why I have so much respect for communities that are historically marginalized because most of their lives are experienced that way, right? As mm -hmm. gender non-conforming person or, you know, any number of um, bodies, lives, trauma stories, um, self-expressions, lots of artists. Their natural movements are deemed strange at best and perhaps deeply bad and judged at worst. And so I'm really looking at that in my own being and holding what's what, when's when, what's the time to really be in harmony with the whole, and what's the time to be deeply in alignment with my own knowing of truth. And I think that tension is actually creating new harmonies, and that's what I'm looking for. That's where the juice is for me. Is there anything that you're excited about right now that you'd like to share? Mm. So many things. 
The first thing that comes to mind when you asked it is the children. I really think keeping our gaze on the kids. I don't have children in this life, but I am an auntie to many. And when I just picture their face or receive a voice memo from my friend's one-year-old saying, Happy singing, Lisa, hi. (laughs) Everything in my life feels unimportant. And the whole perspective comes back to, you know, I think we're here to have fun. <laughs> and can we take a play, you know, a play from the the one-year-old's playbook here and just remember our natural state is presence and joy. We have a video of our granddaughter when she was one year old. She's three and a half now, but when she was one and a half or so, going down a slide that was about the same height as she was, a little plastic backyard slide. And she she went down it, you know, shoop, and she got down to the bottom and she looked up and she said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that was trippy. <laughs> You know, that was this wild experience. Completely authentic. Whoa. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Lightning round questions. I almost skipped them. How could I do that? What's an album that was really important to you? Mm, I spent hundreds of hours listening to Peter Gabriel's uh, soundtrack for The Last Temptation of Christ called Passion. That soundtrack was deeply influential, and he's one of my... Yeah, I'm I'm his fangirl. <laughs> Fabulous. What is your favorite soup? Soup. Ooh. Soup. Oh, so many soups. So many good ones. How to choose. Mm, potato leek. That's a way to choose. <laughs> what is a sound that you feel strongly about? Doesn't have to be a beautiful sound or it's just any sound that you feel strongly about. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is negative. It's like the the strength of my aversion to car alarms going off uh-huh. without yeah. cessation. I feel trapped in, in hell. Yes. <laughs> yes. I hear you. I absolutely hear you. Ah. <laughs> Who is an artist you wish more people listened to? Well, that feels impossible. I think I, what I would want to say in response to that is that artists that are near you that aren't on the radio yet you know like really like listening to the people in our own communities especially the ones that we don't immediately relate to to me that's where bridging happens it's like um listening to an album that isn't my instant oh my god yes but really kind of at the more i listen the more i find appreciation i think Um, reaching for those artists is just a really beautiful use of our energy. I was so surprised to learn, I don't know why I was surprised, but I was so surprised to learn how much repetition affects whether or not we like something. Super true. The simple act of hearing something three times, we're going to like it more than the thing we've only heard once. Absolutely the case. Yeah. Yeah. Where can we find you and follow your projects or buy your music? Mm, Thank you. I'm very consciously not in a mode of widespread marketing in my world right now. I'm not here for breadth and influence. I've kind of pieced out of all the socials and and yet um, it is, of course, my deepest heart's joy to come into presence and connection with like-hearted souls. And so that is really coming through for me in an interest in more recording and I'm planning to record more and more music and I'm creating new and more music in different contexts. So I have an album. It's on all of the, um, all of the platforms now, Night Song, and Mm -hmm. it's on my website. And it's beautiful and it will be linked in 
the show notes. Thank you. Yeah. I can say I didn't have to listen to it more than once to love it. Uh, thanks, Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> and I have more coming. My website, of course, the online song library is a resource I'm proud of and continuing to build. And that's free. Are there any questions that I didn't ask you that you wished I had? Aww. <laughs> I can't think of anything in this moment. I'm just feeling gratitude. And I'm feeling like I want the opportunity to ask you as many good questions <laughs> as you asked me. I mean, we're all so fascinating. And I really do want to land back in gratitude to what you're building and the space that you're making for these conversations, Patricia, and for feeding the connections in our community song movement, which are formed through friendships and relationship and attractions. And I, I see what you're doing as, as valuable and will stand the test of time. You know, I did the 2014 song a day challenge and it led me to you in 2019. Who knows what yours will do? What a beautiful thought. I love that. A huge thank you to you, Lisa, for coming on a breath of song. And a huge thank you to you, our listeners. I'm so glad you're singing with us. Let me remind you that sharing this podcast with your friends really makes a difference. Visit abreathofsong.com to see show notes with lyrics, links, Patty Petrowski's glorious artwork. Sign up to get a beautiful email with artwork and music in your mailbox. And leave something in the gratitude jar to help us cover costs. Please do Before it. Before Patty or I is paid... Yes. Oh, thank you. 25% is donated to the Jazz Foundation of America, which directly supports jazz blues and roots musicians in need. The skill and the artistry of these musicians, as I said earlier in the podcast, it's directly shaped most of the music that I share on this podcast. But historically, they have been inadequately recognized and unfairly recompensed. And this is a small step toward restoration. Let's sing the Bridging Hearts song again to help it sink in more deeply. Let's do it. As a chance to, to right-size our, all of ourselves. We're part of a team. Yeah. Both our needs have got to get met here. Both, Both our needs were part of the team. team. Both our needs have got to get, get met here. here. So let's... Tend the, the fear and find a bigger picture. I, I care, care about you. Care you. You care about me. You care about me. This is what it feels like in family. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. Help us find our love in this ecology. Both. Our needs have got to get met here. Both our needs, we're part of a team. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about this, this is, is what it feels like in family. family. I care about you. I care about you. You care about me. You care about me. Help us find our love in this ecology. Both our needs have got to get met here. It's part of a plan. Both our needs. It's part of a plan. Both our needs have got to get met here. So let's tend the fear and find the bigger picture. I feel better. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Lisa, thank you so much for coming on today. You're so welcome. And thank you, our listeners and singers, for joining Lisa and me for A Breath of Song. I'm grateful that you are taking care of yourself and listening to your voice. I believe making a better world starts with tuning in to ourselves and each other, which is what we just did. So, yay us. <laughs> If you're liking the podcast, please share with a friend, and next time we'll plant another song. Until then, be well. <laughs> <laughs>